Quick note to our listeners, we need your help. We're close to 1 million views on YouTube, and we have over 5,000 subscribers. But if we can get to 10,000 subscribers by the end of this year, that will allow us to raise money for the Finding Genius Foundation and our study to help those suffering from anxiety, depression, and PTSD. Please just take a second and subscribe to the podcast. And if you can, like the video. That'll help us get more listeners. It'll help with the YouTube algorithm. And again, help us reach our goal of 10,000 subscribers and 1 million views. We're going to hit the 1 million views, it looks like, hopefully by May of 2022. But the 10,000 subscribers will be harder. That's going to take until the end of this year. Thank you. Self-Decode is the world's first precision health platform that frees you from the generic solutions of traditional health care and puts control back in your hands. Using science-backed research and AI-driven algorithms, Self-Decode gives you personalized diet, supplement, and lifestyle suggestions based on your body's blueprint, your DNA. Get started for free with an existing DNA file or order a DNA kit at 25% off with the code GENIUS. Start optimizing your health today at selfdecode.com. Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1%. A real Jesus. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Before we get started, I have a quick favor. I've been self-funding the Finding Genius Podcast for five years now. I've done over 3,000 episodes. And as you can see on YouTube, we're up over a million views on the channel, which is fantastic. The next thing I really want to push on is to get up to 10,000 subscribers. Because once we do, we'll be able to put a donate button and uh, we'll be able to solicit donations uh, to help keep the podcast running and to also get the Finding Genius Foundation moving along. We have a big project studying anxiety, depression, and PTSD and working on a product to help people overcome these problems uh, because I've seen them explode recently after the, uh, you know, the last two years of the whole virus situation. So if you would, please subscribe to the podcast. That would help us tremendously. Give us a thumbs up. And check in the description for Buy Me a Coffee. It's about five bucks. If you could buy me a coffee, I'd really appreciate it. It would help keep the channel going, and I love coffee. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast. I have Gareth Soloway. He's the president and CFO, uh, chief market strategist at In The Money Stocks. And the website is inthemoneystocks.com. No doubt you could find Gareth on YouTube and many other places as well. Uh, he's a pro trader with over 20 years of experience. In his early career, he was uh, big into technical charts. And he's been trading his own capital and created proprietary tactics like what he calls the confirmation signal, the three-tail theory, etc. So, uh, you know, a lot of knowledge in technical trading. And we're going to talk about his world and uh, what's going on with finance. So, Gareth, thanks for coming. Oh, it's truly my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I remember years and years ago, I, you know, I'm sure like a lot of people, I tried my hand at, at trading and I got those books where they talk about like the, the head and shoulders pattern and the, the clouds over the, the mountain and all that stuff. <laughs> um, what, what, what's your background in trading? Like what got you interested and what's your progression been like? Yeah, so that's a great question because it's 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 really pretty normal in terms of you know John Q. Public, I would say. So so I grew up in a uh, in a middle lower income family. Um, both parents were teachers. Uh, we never really invested. I never heard them talking about investments because they didn't really have any money to invest. And um, you know, as as I was progressing through school, I got into high school, and I was getting to that point of you know thinking about college. And and you know, they always say like, oh well, you know, some extracurricular activities to put on your 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 college kind of resume is a good thing. So so I decided to uh, to join the investment club, right? And this happened to be in the late '90s when the dot com bubble was kind of brewing and growing. And, and so I got a fake hundred thousand dollars and, and, you know, before you know it with some of these dot coms, you know, I double tripled my money and coming from, from somewhere where money was not plentiful, it was very addicting. Frankly, it was kind of like, 
holy cow, is this even real? I mean, can this be real? Um, and if it is, then I need to figure out how to do it. And so, so again, you know, think about some high school kid who doesn't really have much. And then all of a sudden you're kind of exposed to this world of massive, massive wealth and the ability to make money. And, and I was like, I was sold. I was just like, all right, th- if, if this is even possible, I've got to figure it out. So I went off to college. Um, I, I became, uh, I majored in economics and, um, and that was kind of the way I thought I'd get into things and, and get in good background for investing and trading. And, and then after that, I, I worked for MetLife for, for one year and I, I was working in their financial investment division, thinking that, oh, I'd be, you know, learning and doing some trading. And, stuff. and really, honestly, you know, I was low man on the totem pole. So it was cold call, you know, get on the phones and just dial, dial, dial. And, and I hated that. Oh, my God, it was the worst. So, so after a year, um, I, I quit. And I said, all right, I have 10,000 bucks. I'm going to go to a firm and, and I'm going to trade my own capital. And, and that's what I did. They gave me $50,000 in buying power for the 10,000 I was putting up. And um, I started. And of course, being somewhat on the newer side, I, I was horrible at it. So I kept on losing money, um, just like most new traders do. And it's so tricky to understand, not get caught in the shadiness of Wall Street and the, the motion and all that stuff. And so I worked, you know, literally I worked side jobs on the weekends, on the night times. I was a bartender, bartending instructor. I did some catering. And, and the goal was always to put m- money back into the account. So as I would lose it, I was not giving up no matter what. I was just not going to give up uh, on this dream. And so I just put more money in and then I'd lose it, put more money. But eventually the tide started to turn. And that's really where it started kind of coming together, where you start to learn when this pattern occurs and it repeats over and over again. If I position myself this way, the the probabilities of success are there. So bottom line is in 2007, I started in the money stocks dot com. And and really, you know, I've just continued to learn and master the charts and and understand that emotion has no place in investing if you want to be a pro. Yeah, it's funny with options, you could do like in the money options dot com because it's the same kind of name and branding for you, too. Where yeah, you do add sure. money here, that kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's funny because you know, recently I, you know, I, I always had I have an option service on in the money stocks.com, but I recently I kind of stopped it just because options are so tricky. I mean, it's hard enough to trade stocks, but then you throw options in the game. And for those of you out there that know what options are, you know, basically there's an expiration date where if they're not in the money, then then you lose a hundred percent. And it's just, you know, to me, it's like, all right, you know what, that's not I've become much more of a proponent of pr- promoting like smart investing and most small investors will lose on options. So, so yeah, it's interesting you say that, but yeah, yeah, options are tricky. It's a very tricky, tricky game. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. I remember 22 years ago, I, I wanted to do day trading and I sat in an office of day traders and I remember like, uh, you know, they would sit there buying and selling on all these different exchanges. And I, I remember some of them would go, Ah, and start screaming and like smash their computer and you know yeah. i said what the, what's going on and they said oh that guy blew up you know he he traded his money until he lost so much he can't continue yeah and then uh the best traders i noticed they just were like completely emotionless and i remember i spoke to one of them i said how do you deal like this like he goes you know my goal is to make i think at the time it was like 500 dollars a day and he goes i'm done when that happens he goes or if i lose more than whatever, 200 or 500 a day, I stopped no matter what. So he was like super disciplined, like an emotionless, yeah. not like a robot, but he was just like, you know, but he, he lasted and he was the best guy in the room. Yeah. So I don't know, like how, what, what is the role of emotion and what you do and how you advise people? How do you control yourself? Yeah. So emotion is really, it's, it's, it's what will break you as an investor or a trader. It gets you to do the wrong thing at the wrong time. It gets you to buy something like Bitcoin when it's at the, at 65,000 just before it tops because everyone's just so excited about it. And so you get that emotional response that is like, Oh, I've missed the boat, but I'm going to jump on now. And of course, that's the wrong time to do it. And same thing on the other side where, you know, people that are in investments, when the markets are at their lows and, 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 things are just so bleak, it makes you kind of say, all right, I just got to get out because it seems like the world's going to end. And that's actually the time to buy. So for me, it took me a long time. But by letting the charts tell me what to do in terms of looking at specifics on the charts, it really allows you to take emotion out of it, meaning that the charts just tell me what to do. I don't I don't pretend to think or don't have any sort of kind of, you know, feelings on the matter. I shut that off. And then looking at the charts, it really does just tell you the purity of it. And what's amazing about the charts is that charts represent human emotion, really. 
And so by reading and almost playing counter trend to human emotion, you're able to actually make money. And, and again, people might say, well, why are charts emotion or human emotion? Well, because buyers and sellers are humans, right? I mean, people are buying stocks or selling or buying crypto, selling crypto. And, and basically a chart as it goes up, it's telling you people are getting greedier and they're running and chasing it and vice versa on the downside. So really that's what a chart represents is that the emotion of the, the investing public. And it's weird because it's if you're a contrarian, if you know how to read that and go opposite, that's where you'll find the big money in investing. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Technical trading seems to be very difficult. Like if you look back anecdotally or, you know, look at the history like, oh, yeah, I could see the double shoulder or this, that pattern. But when you're in the thick of it, how do you know if what you're trading is a fake out or if it's confirmed and if the trend is really going to keep going? Like, I don't know. Yeah. Is, it, is it harder than it sounds? Is it easier than it sounds like what? What are some, you know, without revealing your secret sauce, like, what does it really take to be a successful trader? I mean, it's it, it, just like anything, it takes study, right? So, so I always like to tell people that you, know, you can't expect to come into the market and, and you're, remember, you're facing like billion dollar algorithms that Goldman Sachs and these, these bigger companies built and they're sharks. I mean, think of great white sharks and we're kind of like the seals in the water. So you have to learn how to avoid the, the kind of the pitfalls there of, of, of that kind of stuff. So, so if you're going to be a brain surgeon, Right. You have to go to school for X amount of years. You have to study and all this stuff and you have to pay. I mean, think about the amount of money. Right. So so the same thing applies to investing. If you if you if you want to be a pro, if you want to be someone that's making money, you're going to have to put some some energy and effort into studying it. So that's number one. But I think number two is that, you know, the charts. What I found is that when you have specific rules and this is, this is the discipline of trading, is that when you have specific rules that you abide by, you start to recognize that, okay, I've done this type of pa pattern trade 50 times or 100 times, and out of 100 times, it works out 80% of the time. So as long as you have those probabilities on those pattern formations and you actually know what to look for, then you actually start to become the casino house versus the gambler. Like the gambler walks in, generally 1,000 gamblers go in, most of them will lose, one or two may win, but you want to be the house of the casino. So everything I do is based on this pattern forms X amount of times and it, it makes this move per X percent of times. And I'm just looking for those repetitive features in the market. And the reason why they work generally more times than they don't is because again, it's all human emotion, right? So you know that when people are buying that Bitcoin at 65 or 68,000 and there's so much hype, you know, you're near a turning point, vice versa. You know, recently we saw, we saw crypto just bottoming out and people were panicking as UST was collapsing and all this other stuff. And same thing applied. People were overly panicked and then now we're seeing the bounce back. So it, it's just, again, it's, it's noticing and, and studying patterns. And then when they repeat and you know the percentages on them and you've done it for as many years as I, you start to just become robotic and you say, okay, well, listen, two times out of a 10, I'm going to lose on this trade, but you know what? Eight times I'm going to win. So let me just always do it and then let the percentages kind of handle themselves. So maybe one of the most predictable things is uh, patterns that coincide with investor psychology around a certain pattern or a set of patterns. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, so everything that I'm looking at, like when you see a, when you see a move off of a low on a chart and it starts to go sideways, what that's telling you is that you had buyers that were probably big money buyers buying at the low. And now you're seeing an equal amount of buyers and sellers fighting and that's creating a sideways move in a chart, right? There's, there's 50 buyers, there's 50 sellers. So price isn't moving. Well, what that tells you is that the, the sellers that have, were just causing that market to drop or that stock to drop and then the bounce back buyers. Now the, there's, there's not too many sellers anymore. And what that tells you again is that sentiment is starting to change into a more bullish formation or bullish action. And you're likely going to get another move up. That's in, in technical trading known as a bull flag for instance. So, so yes, there's exact, I mean, basically that's what you're looking at. You're looking at buyers and sellers. How are they acting? How many of each are there? And that gives you kind of that edge to kind of guess uh, with higher probabilities on what the next move will be. Okay. How do you even gauge investor sentiment? I mean, do you, as a trader, are you at, at various points, like once a day or once a week, looking at certain factors to tell you what investor sentiment in it is? Is it, or is it just a, a general feeling? Oh, well, everyone seems to be in a, in a down mood and fearing that the market's going down or, you know, like have you quantified investor sentiment somehow into a heuristic or algorithm? 
Yeah, yeah. So I don't have a specific algorithm, but I do have components that I look at. So number one, I, I look at like a, something like a CNBC. I look at a, you know, the, the financial media out there. You know, the more articles that are popping in front of me talking about like, you know, this is such a scary market. It's a bear market or, or this is an amazing bull. It's going to go on forever. I start to say, okay, sentiment is too much to one direction. I also look at social media. Social media has become an amazing platform to gauge sentiment. Uh, one of the best signals I do is I post on on Twitter, right? I'll, I'll you know I'll say, hey guys, I like this stock in this direction or this crypto in this direction. And if you the more people attack that point of view and say, oh you're crazy, da da da, and and they're never attacking it in a technical way. It's always emotional, right? Oh you're crazy. You're never going to see this go below this price. And all of a sudden, the more people that do that, the more it makes me realize that sentiment has gotten too bullish in that scenario. And then you're likely to see something like Bitcoin come back in, which is, you know, back in, back in November, I was the only person out there that was saying Bitcoin isn't going to go any higher than, than the 65, 69,000. And we've obviously seen it come down dramatically, but I mean, people were just calling me insane at that point, but it was a great technical kind of, uh, you know, emotional indicator. So, so social media, the media as a whole are great ways to do it. And you just get this sense by talking to friends, you know, when there's real panic out there, when friends are always coming to you and saying, Oh my goodness, did you see this? Oh my goodness, where is the market going to go? That fear is very pervasive and it shows you that it's permeated a lot of the population. And you start to kind of say, okay, let me now go to the charts knowing that and look for a double bottom. Let me look for a trend line. Let me see what we're hitting here that's also telling me that there could be support. So if you were to compare the two, the technical symbols with you know the psychology of crowds and of the market, which one's more reliable? I'm sure the two together are, are more reliable than anything, but of the two, you know, if you only picked one, then maybe it's a stupid question, but which one's more reliable? I would say honestly the charts because the charts represent the, the emotion within just in a form of a chart. Um, so again, like if I could tune out and listen, we didn't have, you know, social media 15 years ago, really, or 20 years ago, and you could still use charts to kind of predict price action. So I would definitely say charts, but for, but for sure, the more factors you have, and this is something I always talk about how, you know, it's one thing to have like a double bottom in a stock, but if you could have a double bottom that also coincides with a bottoming tail with, you know, the social media indicators telling you that, that things are overdone, the odds of success are going to go up. You know, one factor, like I say, is, you know, maybe 60, 70%. Uh, success rate. But if you could get three factors, now you're up to 80 plus percent success rate. So it's definitely getting as many things in the right direction as possible. Well, I, I don't know uh, what goes on now, but there used to be many, many exchanges where people would trade, you know, Archipelago and this, that, the other, NASDAQ, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Do you look for the same patterns to form across different exchanges? Is there any point in doing that? Is that also a confirmation or a disconfirmation signal? If you see you know, two different markets, same stock, but the patterns are different for some reason. Yeah, so so for the most part, like Arca and, uh, and uh, Net, Net, uh, uh, Inet, they have like night night trading and different different paths and, and exchanges. They're all kind of combined into you know your level two, and so it's all traded together, and then it shows up on the chart. So that data should come across on the chart. So so really, it's all combining that data so that you get it all in one easy kind of way to read. Yeah, now not only is there social media, but you've got. I mean, we've always had institutional trading. And, um, you know, high frequency computer trading. How does that affect your analysis now? Does it is the time scale so long that you look at, you know, even if it's like 10, 20 seconds that it doesn't matter or, you know, how, how does that yeah. play into your analysis nowadays? Yeah, I mean, you, you definitely always have to be be aware of that there is there is kind of this this high frequency trading, these algorithm trading. But a lot of the time, it's it just kind of like I look at a big enough time frame where the smallest time frame I'm day trading off of would be like the 10 minute chart, which is so each candle is going to be 10 minutes. And generally, I even go as big as like the 60 minute the hourly or the daily. Um, and, and again, the bigger the time frame, the more fluid and kind of reactionary the chart is going to be, where it's going to kind of smooth out those little you know, the quick little trades by these algorithms that are just trading for a penny here back and forth with each other uh, versus versus what we're looking for, which is more of a macro move. So like on a swing trade, for instance, holding a swing trade, something where I'm buying something and I'm going to hold it for days or maybe even a couple of weeks. So the general move will still play out in that in that time frame. Oh, good. So you're not affected by that. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, yeah. Are, you, are you seeing I mean, what what are you affected by? What are some of the new things that 
are affecting trading analysis. So you mentioned social media. So how does that tend to play in? Do you monitor it? Do you ignore it? And the charts are your friend. You don't have to worry about social media. But like, what factors outside of, you know, just charts now are affecting your analyses? Yeah, I, th I think one of the biggest things to kind of keep in mind that I've caught that I've kind of become aware of is that specifically in the crypto markets, and this isn't as much for the stock market because you still have these institutions that are holding Apple and so forth, but the crypto markets are driven by greed and fear, right? I mean, there's so many small investors out there. So what that does is it makes that makes crypto go much, much higher than you think it can go and much, much lower than you think it can go because there's so much retail kind of emotion that's being pushed either way. Now, if you look at a stock like Apple, I mean, you know, you have Warren Buffett owning a huge, but he's not trading, he's not panicking in, in those scenarios. So you don't get that same sort of crazy, crazy, ridiculous moves. Do you see crypto uh, settling down emotionally and looking more like the stock market? Like it is, is it anywhere close to that or is it still just a wild ride? self decode is taking the guesswork out of wellness. By analyzing your genes, lab tests, and lifestyle data, self decode provides the most holistic and personalized plan for optimal health. They're giving our listeners 25% off new DNA kits with the code GENIUS, or you can get started free if you have an existing DNA file. Visit selfdecode.com to learn more. Yeah, so so right now it's a wild ride. It, crypto is is absolutely a a risk asset, which means that when people are panicking and, and the markets, we are seeing the stock markets going down, crypto is going to go lower. I do think eventually crypto settles down and becomes more of a mature asset, especially Bitcoin. Uh, I really do believe that Bitcoin will be the future digital gold out there where it'll be a store of safety. But you know what I always say to people is keep in mind that Bitcoin has only been around since 2009. So it's effectively a 13 year old. So we can't look at and say, you know, you don't look at a 13 year old and say, okay, you need to act like a 50 or 60 year old or a grandparent, right? They're, they're very emotional at that age. They're very kind of off the wall. And that's the way crypto is behaving because it's, it's a young asset. Now, if you look at gold, right? Gold is, is been around for, is used as a store of safety for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And it only moves like 1% on a crazy day, maybe half a percent on a normal day. So you get much more of a stable, mature asset in that in that respect. So eventually, I think crypto grows into that, but it's just such, such a new asset right now that it's very, very volatile. People are still trying to figure it out. Absolutely. Yeah, I like your analysis compared to a 13-year-old. I, yeah. I have a 13-year-old and a 15-year-old and a 16. There you go. <laughs> and they're very emotional. Do you, I don't know how far you've looked back historically, but have people's emotions and have the markets really fundamentally changed, you know, now versus a decade ago or two or three or four or five decades? Is it, Not, has it always been the same in your, in your view? Yeah. It, to be honest, uh, you know, emotion, human emotion doesn't change. I mean, you could go back 500 years and there was a, the tulip craze in, 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 I think it was in, you know, the, the Dutch, way, you know, something, something like that, but it was, it was, you know, long, long time ago and tulips, they became such a prized possession that literally, you know, someone's entire fortune just to buy a tulip bulb. I mean, that's what it was going for. And obviously that was a bubble back then and, and it ended up collapsing and it was a meteoric collapse and, and every, you know, obviously the bottom fell out, but the same thing kind of had happened is that people had become so enamored with this, this tulip and a tulip bulb that they were willing to pay any price whatsoever for it. And it created one of the first major bubbles that we have a historic record of. Um, and the same thing goes today. I mean, you look at some of these uh, cryptocurrencies that are created like as memes, right, as jokes, and they get $50 billion valuations or go back to the dot-com bubble. I mean, there were dot-com companies that were run out of their parents' basement and they literally barely made any money and they were given, you know, $100 million valuations by Wall Street at the time just because they had dot-com attached, attached to their name. So it's really amazing how things don't change. And that's one of the reasons why the charts work so well and are so predictive because everything is very, very much this happened in the past, greed and fear, you know, pushed it. And same thing right now, you have greed and fear. And, and you could argue that, again, over the last three or four years, you had the Fed printing money. There was no fear. So there was more greed. Money was getting pushed into the system. People felt like the markets could never go down because the Fed was always there backstopping. So greed just got a hold of it and pushed every asset price up, you know, real estate, stocks, cryptocurrencies, uh, everything. And now you're seeing, okay, wait, now fear is starting to realize or people are starting to realize that the Fed is no longer there. They're starting to raise rates, at least for now. 
And now asset prices are really starting to deflate. We've seen Bitcoin come down over 50%. The NASDAQ's down about 25%. So, so it's amazing how it, it really is over and over again repetitive in terms of fear and greed, fear and greed, and the, the periods in between. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. There's a lot of people out there that have a trading system and have, you know, I pick stocks and blah, 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 that in the aggregate, what separates the people that seem to do well over a long time versus the ones that offer advice and then everything blows up and, you know, they lose all their people and they lose all their own money. Yeah. So I I think, I think the biggest difference is the discipline involved, right? So one of the things I've found and has made me last 15 now years within the money stocks.com recently, I launched verified investing crypto.com is that it's all about keeping people from jumping in all in on a position, right? So, so there's a lot of websites where they promise you, you know, you know, you know, you can double your account overnight or that's all nonsense, right? A smart investor who's really going to build wealth is going to allocate a very small percentage and diversify amongst many stocks or many cryptocurrencies or cryptocurrencies and stocks and metals and all that stuff. And I think that's been the key is like a lot of times I go into positions with my members where we're only buying 1% of our portfolio in it, just starting a position. Now we may add to that at a certain point and bring it to two or three or four or 5%, but we're not putting a hundred percent and God forbid, we're not, you know, in, in the, in the crypto market, we're not doing 10 times or a hundred times leverage because that's how you blow people up. And, you know, there's no perfect trader out there. I, I take plenty of losses. You know, I take two, three losses out of every 10, but because I'm keeping my percentages in alignment and my allocations, then my winners outpace my losers. And there's a lot of people out there that are just like, you know what, let's, you know, I can make, you know, people go to them because they're promising the world and then they end up blowing their accounts up. And that's, that's really the detriment. Do you see any uh, future trends coming in the stock market that are going to change how investors should look at the market or will look at the market or trade? I mean, I, I think the biggest change right now that we're going through in terms of, of the stock market is, is a stock market that since 2009 and the Great Recession is now basically a stock market where the, the bumpers are off the lanes, right? I mean, you don't have the bumpers, the protection of the Fed anymore. And so investors have to start to realize that. And this is, this is why there's more downside in the market over the next three, six months, in my opinion, because you have a Fed that's not, no longer printing money that help, is helping asset prices go up. And so the investors that are the, the smartest, the ones that are on the cutting edge, they, they knew not to fight the Fed from 2009 to 2021 because the Fed was always doing QE, especially during COVID. It was like QE on steroids. But now it's the opposite where the Fed is basically – you know, pulling everything back. So we heard, we heard, I mean, I, I got knows so many times I heard on TV, don't fight the Fed all the way up through to 2021. But now I'm not hearing don't fight the Fed, which would tell people to actually exit the market or play it more defensively. So I think you have to, as an investor, there's always going to be a bull market somewhere. But when the bull market ends, you can't say, no, I'm refusing to admit that that bull market is no longer there. You have to say, okay, it's over. Now let me look for the next one. Where's the next one going to be? Is it going to be in metals? Is it going to be in, in commodities? Is it going to be in crypto? Is it going to be in real estate? I mean, there's, there's always going to be a, a bull market somewhere. But again, don't overstay your welcome in the current bull market. Okay, makes sense. I don't know. What, uh, can you have too much information? Like, you know, hedge funds that have quants and they analyze thousands of factors. And do you think they're any better off than um, what, you know, the kind of analysis you can do? Is there is there too much that you can look at, too much that you consider that just paralyzes you? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that investors run into that, just average investors run into that very much so, meaning that, you know, there's so many indicators you can put on your charts. I mean, there, I, there's so many that I don't even know what they do or how to read them, frankly. Um, my charts are very pure. I, I keep them with, you know, candlesticks. That's it. And then sometimes I'll throw in moving averages or I'll do a Fibonacci retrace, but that's really it. Um, and And the chart to me is... I look at a chart like a, a book that's in a foreign language. So, you know, you open a book in a foreign language and you have no clue what it says. You see a lot of words in a different language. But once you learn that language, you can start to read it. So when you learn how to read the candlestick formations, oh, look, that's a bull flag. Oh, look, that's a bear flag. That's a time count. You know, different things like that. Double bottoms, topping tails, bottoming tails. Like just these simple formations give you so much information that I don't need these crazy um, exponential, you know, signals and, 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 you know, scanners 
to, to make money in the market. And I think investors do themselves a detriment when they have like 30 indicators on their screen. And it's like, well, which one do I look at? This one's telling me this, this one's telling me this, and I don't know what to believe. And same thing with a lot of these firms, a lot of these big firms like a Goldman Sachs or these hedge funds, they might have a hundred people and each one's job is to look at two indicators, which is okay. But, you know, individually, we don't have that luxury if we're not part of a big institution with billions and billions of dollars. So how do you know, um, you know, even in the charts, are there opportunities where certain formations, I mean, so I, I would guess certain formations are common, certain formations are rare. Are there certain candlestick arrangements that are deceptive for some reason, or do they all reveal what's going on? Yeah, yeah. So, so one of the things, you know, one of the creations that I've come up with is, is something that's called the confirmation signal. And, you know, back in my early years, you know, I would see a chart that looks like it was breaking out or breaking down, and I would jump on board. I would buy that breakout, right? It, this, the candle was just moving above this previous trend line or this previous high, and then all of a sudden it would reverse, and I'd end up losing being down on the trade, and I'm like, what the heck? And what I found out is that, you know, oftentimes institutions will know that there's a lot of investors that will do that. And so what they'll do is they'll peak a chart or they'll peak a candle just above a level, knowing it's going to lure in a lot of money. Um, and then they'll just reverse it and kind of take that money away. And so what I like to look for is I like to look for not just one candle close above a, re a resistance line for a breakout, but actually a secondary close even higher. And that gives me what I call a confirmation signal. And usually when that happens, it's not a fake out. So again, the confirmation signal, it, it essentially tells you the difference between a, a real breakout and a fake out versus and a real breakdown or a fake out breakdown. But the idea again is that institutions if there, there's too much money that they're having to invest to keep a chart above a level where there's too much money on the line. So once they can peak it above for a day, but if it stays above for more than a day or so, it likely is a real breakout. So like these little symbols, these little signals you can look for in the charts, and they really do tell you quite a lot about what likely is going to happen. And I stress likely because there is no magic sauce. There's no perfect formula for no losers. But again, it's all about probabilities. Can you get the probabilities to 70, 80 percent, in which case your Hall of Fame at that level, if you can win seven, eight times out of every 10, just keep doing what you're doing and the money takes care of itself. Yeah, I would guess that looking for one or more confirmation signals means that you may not profit as much from a particular move, but you're a lot more safe and a higher percentage of your bets will be correct. Is, do you see that trade off? Yes. And in fact, that's one of the best points ever is that as a, a newer traders always go into a trade where they're like, OK, I'm going to make a million dollars on this trade. I'm going to be dead right. The pros and myself included here, I go into every trade, even knowing that I win 80 percent of the time on all my trades. I still go into trades with just dipping a toe in the water, thinking I might be wrong. And that's the difference maker, because, again, you know, you taking small losses allows your account to only have small drawdowns so that when you have more winners, you go into the green. When you go in and, yeah, you might put all your money in a position and think you're a genius and you're going to make money. And you might make your money, your, a ton of money the first trade, the second trade, the third trade. But if you mess up on the fourth, it wipes out three quarters of your account and the math just doesn't work out. Real wealth is built by taking it slow and being more defensive and accumulating. I do a lot of dollar cost averaging of positions, even swing trades, because I find that you know in panic levels when I'm buying a stock that's collapsing, it could easily pierce my level where I'm buying. But if I leave myself a couple more buying opportunities with some extra money there, then I can actually bring my average down. The bounce eventually comes. The probabilities ultimately work, and you can get yourself in the right position. So again, always go into a trade with skepticism, knowing that you have read the factors you believe to be right. The thesis is correct, but understanding that it may be wrong, and that actually will help you make more money in the long run. Well, how so? Do you have a hedge component, like a stop loss? Or again, have you used options to hedge? Or what do you do to make sure that... Um if a position starts to go wrong, that you get out safely? Yeah, so you always need to have your exit strategy, right? So you always have to say like, okay, if, if this, so I'm buying this at this particular level. Now it could pierce my level by a little bit, in which case I'm in a dollar cost average. So what I do is what I'll say, okay, I'm going to commit $50,000 to Apple at this price, let's say. And, and essentially what I'll do is I'll buy 
I'll, I'll say, okay, well, if I'm willing to have a full position at 50,000, I'm going to buy one fifth position at this price here. And then if it drops $2, I'm going to drop, buy another one fifth. And if it drops two dollars and you can accumulate down to your max loss level where you say, okay, at this price, the thesis is broken and I will exit it at that point. So you always have to have that exit strategy, but by adding slowly at levels, you actually get a better average overall. And when the bounce comes, if the bounce comes, you end up making a lot more money because your average is lower. And essentially, yes, you always need an exit strategy. You always have to have, okay, if it gets down to here, the thesis, then the reason I bought is incorrect. But also you go in with a healthy skepticism saying, hey, listen, I might buy at $150, but who's to say it's not going to at least quickly go down to 149 or 148 before it bounces back to 55. And I love that kind of ability to say, I'm going to be careful. I'm going to be conservative. And then ultimately finding out that that's, that has actually made me a lot more money over time in terms of swing trading. Yeah. How often is there a fake out, even if the trend looks solid? And does that, does that kick out most traders that don't expect that to happen? Yeah, there, there definitely can be fake outs. Um, you know, in general, when you're playing certain chart setups, like I said, you can, you can see these pierces of these levels a little bit, but it should technically, it shouldn't break to a certain degree, right? So, I mean, like piercing by a buck, that could just be the market was selling that day and and the stock pierced a double bottom by a dollar. Um, if it goes down $10, now, now your thesis is broken. That double bottom is obviously null and void at that point. So you have to kind of have that in your head based on, all right, why am I buying this? And that's always a thing to have. And in fact, having a piece of paper there, write down your factors. All right, I'm buying this because it's fallen for seven straight days. That's a time count. It has a double bottom here. Um, you know, I, I'm expecting this based on, let's say, the moving average hit. It hit the 200 moving average, whatever it may be. And then uh, saying, all right, start small, knowing that fear and panic driving this stock is down. And in general, we're going counter trend here, which is kind of mind blowing to a lot of investors. But that's how I make a majority of my money is finding these lows and highs and going inverse to them. But that's ultimately the key is that have have your accumulation zone. And then at a certain point, if it keeps going, you have to be able to cut it at that point. When you're doing contrarian stuff, though, like where are you entering? Like what, what would be an example of this? At what point of a trend do you enter? All right, so so great example here. Like, um, and and again, I, I know I can't show charts or anything like that, but like like there's a company called C Limited. S E is the symbol on it, and the stock in November was trading at three hundred and seventy dollars a share. Um, it has collapsed all the way down just in since November to fifty dollars a share. Right, so you, you've had this massive collapse. But if you look at the chart, you'll see that just at that $50 level, there was a pivot high in 2020, and it was another high in, in late 2020, right at that point. And that move up began from $50 that went to 375 at that point. So you've done a full 100% retrace of the entire move up from 50 to 175 or 375, excuse me. You've now come back to 50 and you're right into these pivot points. And that's, and so basically, the stock has fallen at this point 80 plus percent. You're buying at a particular support level, but you're really kind of going counter trend because the stock's declined from 375 to 50 dollars, right? So I mean, you're going, you're buying now versus going short, and you're expecting a bounce here. But it's a very educated bounce. It's an extreme reaction of emotion where the stock probably shouldn't have been at 375 dollars. But also, it probably shouldn't be as low as $50. And sure enough, the stock has bounced back to $70 just in the last few days, interestingly enough, um, which percentage-wise is 40%. I mean, incredible bounces in terms of percentage that you can get, which brings me to the other point is, you know, if you play this right, you don't have to put a lot of money on the line, which means you're not risking a lot. But when you get 40% moves on stocks in a couple of days, you make plenty of money overall. Yeah, true. Any any memorable stories, crazy trades or things that happened that were totally unexpected or just like a rewarding confirmation of what you thought that you were talking about? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the biggest ones that, you know, I, I remember my losers vividly in my early career. And I still remember, you know, this was in my early career when I still had to learn some lessons. I had accumulated about $100,000. And one day I was I was day trading and, and you know, I, I made the mistake of not accepting that something was not going to bounce and not having a real firm stop out. And, you know, I started buying a stock intraday and, and it kept on going lower and I just kept on adding and I didn't, you know, what I always recommend people doing, and we talked about it earlier is, 
you know, ha before you even enter a trade, say, I will commit X amount of dollars to it and that's it. And then if you want to buy one quarter of that to start, that's fine, you know, and then you can average in and dollar cost average. But it, in this situation, I wasn't at that point in my career yet. And I, I went in too heavy and then I had to add even more and then I had to add even more. And by the end of the day, I lost 70,000 of that 100,000. And literally, I mean, that's, again, those are, those are losses that take so long to come back from that it's, it's like, I mean, it just blows you, almost blows your account up. And so I vividly remember that. And it was a great, and it, it, it sucked, it stunk, you know, but it was a good learning opportunity for me and saying, okay, I will never let that happen again. Now, how do I go to the, the drawing board and make sure that that doesn't happen again? But that, I mean, that was just, I still remember being like in, a, in like kind of a daze, you know, to, to be a young trader and to lose that type of money in one single day. It was, it was nuts. Yeah, what would you say are the biggest changes in your strategy now that you've uh, smartened up? Yeah, I, I would say, I mean, again, the biggest thing for me is 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 finding and figuring out ahead of time. Before I take a trade, I say, okay, I'm going to buy Apple today or I'm going to buy Microsoft. I, I'm willing to commit, you know, let's say $100,000 to Apple today. And then saying, okay, well, this is my first support level. I'm going to buy $25,000 of Apple. And then if it gets to my second, I'll do another twenty five. dollars But I will never go over that hundred. And that was that big mistake that I made there where I bought basically a full position to start. And then what, cause, cause I, you know, as a young trader, you feel invincible. You're like, oh, I'm never going to lose. I'm, this is going to be an easy winner. So let me put all everything I have right into it right away. And then all of a sudden it goes against you and you're like, holy crap, what do I do? Well, I averaged in more and more and more and just accumulated this massive position, which I ultimately took a loss on. So I think, I think going in ahead of time with a game plan of how much total will you be willing to buy, sticking to it. I think trading journals are so important for people because it's not about the winners we learn from, but it's the losers. So every night write in, okay, I did three trades today. It was One was on this. What did I do right? What did I do wrong? And then looking that over every week, read over it because reading things over, writing them down, those lessons get ingrained in your mind much, much better. And you'll learn your learning curve is much faster. And, and the best thing, the, the thing that will save you the most money is by learning the, the faster you learn, the less money you will lose in the market. And remember, the market's going to make you pay. All right. It's, it's either you pay for education via like some trading books and some trading webinars or, or courses, or the market will make you pay. I did it the hard way. I, I spent I, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars losing money because the market was making me learn the hard way. It was teaching me lessons, and I was paying the market to learn those lessons. So definitely, you know, education is so, so important when it comes to trading. You've got to be informed. This is a, it's, a, it's really, in many ways, a shark-infested waters, and you need to be able to avoid and see things in the charts so you don't get caught off guard. So what kind of um, services do you provide? I mean, do you... Do you consulting with people that pay you or is it more just, you know, you have subscribers and you offer information, but not specific advice. Like what do you offer to uh, listeners and viewers? Yeah. So, so uh, what I try to do is I try to couple my services with lots of education since I think that's the most important thing. So um, on in the money stocks.com, I have a service called uh, verified investing alerts. And basically as I take trades, I give out the trade signals to people. So, you know, if I buy Apple at 150 bucks, I post it up and I say, and I send an alert out and I say, Hey guys, I just bought Apple. And I just basically tell them what I'm doing. Each individual person can decide, Hey, do I want to follow him on this one? Or do I want to skip this trade? Totally up to them. Same thing when I exit, I let people know that I exit and they have that option to follow me. So that's one component of basically giving them every trade that I see in the charts. The other one is a daily video. So every day I do at least a 20 minute long video. I recap the market based on the charts. We go over, you know, every little nuance of the charts. Why did this happen? What was this pattern formation? Do you see this bull flag here and see how on this can on this candle it started to break to the upside and really trying to teach people. And then and then the other website, Verified Investing Crypto, same structure service, just all about cryptocurrencies. So again, I put out trade signals on cryptos, buys and sells. And then I also do a daily video, same thing with lots of education. So so I like to, you know, the, the idea behind it is I don't mind giving people fish, you know, and they say, you know, teach a man to fish versus versus giving him fish. So I don't mind giving fish, but I also give the opportunity through these daily videos for people to actually learn how to fish on their own and become kind of more independent and at least know what they're doing. You know, in the very basics, just know what you're doing. Um, because like I always tell people, like I won't be doing this forever. So so if you if you see and you've made as much money following me as you have, 
at least learn it so that when I say, okay, guys, I'm going to be done with this part of my career, you have that ability to do it on your own. Excellent. Well, Gareth, where can people go to find out more about you and to start watching your content, viewing it? Yeah, sure. So, so Twitter is an awesome place to follow me for free. Uh, I post lots of great charts up there and little market commentary. And then, and then the website in the money You can, you can sign up for verified investing alerts under my name on the website. And again, that gets you the, the stock trades and, and ETFs and the daily videos and then verified investing crypto.com for, for eat, uh, cryptocurrency trading as well as daily videos there as well. And thank you so much for having me. It's, it's really been an honor. Yeah, no problem. I was just about to thank you. So appreciate it, Gareth. It's been a great call. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. And, and you guys have a wonderful, wonderful day there. Here's some parting words from Self Decode's founder, Joe. In a world of uncertainty, we've got you. Before taking control of my health, I had almost given up hope of the life I dreamed of. Then I realized the answers I needed were inside my DNA all along. Let us help you find yours. Start free with an existing DNA file or use code GENIUS to save 25% on a kit. A healthier life is waiting for you at selfdecode.com. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.